good evening. We'll go ahead and get started. If uh, you'd like, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles 29. We've got just a, a small section there to finish up before we turn back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 2. If I asked you to describe David's current physical state, what how would you describe that? Hmm? Yeah, frail. Uh, and David it would be approximately 70 at this point in time. And 70 is not, you know, it's not old, old. But when you look at David's life up to this point, has he had a, an, easy, an easy path? Yeah, it's, it's been difficult for him. Uh, a lot of enormous amounts of stress. Uh, and some of that, you know, out of his control, not, not his fault. Some of it was, maybe, you know, as far as his, fa his own family goes. But regardless, uh, he's at the point now where uh, life has be become very difficult for him. And uh, trying to run a kingdom especially would be difficult. But has David <coughs> seen any rebellions Experienced any rebellions up to this point? You know that's that's been a, a large part of his his rule as well, and uh, the latest one was again from his own household, his own son, Adonijah, and so uh, you know uh, he uh, he put Solomon basically in in uh, on the throne. You know, Solomon has been anointed to uh, to extinguish, I guess, that that revolt that was on the on the the rise. But uh, you know, not everybody was there at that point in time. Now, I think when we turn to First uh, Chronicles twenty eight, I think that's what this assembly is somewhat all about. Everybody is in this assembly that David calls uh, calls in, as far as Solomon, the elders, the leaders. Of uh, of Israel, uh, everybody is is on the forefront here. And of course, David, you know, he opens this and his, his speech here, and uh, he, he's going to open by saying, you know, I had it in my heart to build a house for the Lord's ark, but what was God's plan? Yeah, for Solomon, it was not it was not for David to do that. And David, uh, he he. He accepted that. He embraced that, even though he, it was something he really wanted. He understood his role, and he was thankful for his role. After all, I mean, you think about it, and he, you know, he reflects back. He says, you know, going back to Judah and his father's house and, and this lineage, and how he, who was probably perceived as the, the, the least of his brothers, was chosen to be king over Israel and play such a vital role in God's plan, and how he, uh, God has blessed him and prospered him, and uh, and yet we see as he continues his speech, he'll go from you know pointing at one part of his audience, and then he'll go back and forth to another part of his audience. He tries to encourage Solomon, you know, and and the reign that he has set before him to be uh, faithful to the Lord, to stick to his commandments and honor his uh, his laws and. Uh, remain faithful that he may be blessed throughout his rule and his reign and this dynasty can, can continue through David's, David's line. But also, then he would talk to the elders of Israel and try to encourage them to you know, support uh, Solomon in his reign and aid him, uh, even uh, acknowledging that you know, Solomon is a young, inexperienced man and this you know, especially the building of this temple, this was a big project. This was going to be a, a massive undertaking. And so, you know, it's just encouragement back and forth. Even to the point where he talks about the contributions that were made um, toward this uh, project, uh, the temple construction, and how David had taken from Israel's resources, but not only Israel's, you know, David believed in this project so much that he contributed of his own personal wealth. And it's, it's quite a contribution that David gives. And of course, he, you know, he asked the, the elders and leaders of Israel to do the same. And how did they respond? They did. And they did cheerfully. And it was just, it was a really encouraging, uh, uplifting time. David leads the entire assembly in prayer and uh, 
thanksgiving for their attitude and praise that you know God's people would always have this same type of attitude to contribute to to God's cause, whatever it may be, and remain uh, steadfast and and faithful in, in all that that they do. And so, uh, at the end of uh, the speech, we see that David uh, offers uh, a sacrifice. The assembly offers a sacrifice, and it's it's quite a sacrifice. A thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs uh, were offered, and uh, everybody ate and drank before the Lord on the day, on that day, with great gladness. So that brings us up to the second half of verse twenty-two of chapter twenty-nine. Anything anybody would like to contribute? Add to that. One thing that you just talked about, David, by his being afraid, in addition to all that you just made mention that he's just been through. I mean, somebody that made it to the age of 70 that have killed thousands of Philistines and many battles. I mean, most kings didn't even last through one war. Was less the meaning that he had, mm -hmm. in addition to the, all the other items that happened in his lifetime. Right. A lot of wear and tear took place, didn't it? Yeah. I was just going to say, you mentioned how encouraging it was. It is, it is encouraging to see David here, what we know was, would consider toward the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he seems to have broken that pattern of how he had been handling situations. And now he's more decisive, he's more focused. And yep. you can see what a, what a difference it, made, it makes in how God's purpose is mm. uh, carried out. Right, right. And you know, I've, I've been told that, and uh, uh, you can probably ask Larson yourself, you know, when you feel like you're kind of at the door, I'm sure there's quite uh, the clarity that comes to mind when you're at that, that stage of your life, wherever, you know, whatever age you may be. But uh, I'm sure uh, everything becomes crystal clear at that point in time, and your priorities are set pretty pretty straight. And especially about thinking about the people who are coming behind you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gone. I'm all right. You know, I, I know what's happening. But then right. you don't want to, for your son, you know, thinking about Solomon, take this and I think David probably reflecting on the mistakes that he had made and the successes he had had and kind of okay how do I pass on the best parts of that to Solomon I think that's that's even the focus here is uh, you can tell he's not like plotting his own successes as much right like God's plan for the future yes interesting because I think a worldly minded person would say what I want to talk about at my death is why everybody should remember me and what he's saying is here's why you should focus on the Lord keep his will yep. and do what he's commanded and instructed and uh, talks about God's blessings and power and all that but also yep. talks about Solomon's focus on that you know we and we, we spoke too that you know David had had these private conversations already with the leaders of Israel and then you know he spent a lot of time with Solomon obviously talking to him in preparation but now you know he has them as a collective whole and it's as if you know all right you know we need to make sure we're all on the same page here because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be here much longer. And so this is important and everybody needs to be on the same page. And so, uh, yeah, I think David, you know, this is amongst probably his, uh, his, uh, his last words publicly that's spoken here. All right. The second half of verse 22 there in chapter 29 says, And they made Solomon, the son of David, king the second time. And they anointed him as prince for the Lord and Zadok as priest. So it says a second time. Now, the first time was when? What was the setting the first time they anointed Solomon? Yeah, yeah. Adonijah and his crew was just outside of the city, uh, you know, having a meal and kind of getting things together before they uh, tried to take over. And so uh, they, they kind of hastily had to anoint Solomon on uh, on the throne. I think this one is more of the idea that, you know, okay, everybody is here. This is the way it should should have been done the first time. Uh, time didn't permit things to be done in a proper way the first time, so that's what they were doing. I think that's what they were doing on this occasion. 
Verse 23, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of David his father. And he prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. All the leaders and the mighty men, also all the sons of King David, pledged their allegiance to King Solomon. And the Lord made Solomon very great in the sight of all Israel, and bestowed on him such royal majesty as had not uh, been on any king before him in Israel. So we kind of get an overview, a quick overview uh, of Solomon's reign here in in a few words here. But of course, we're, we've got plenty of time. We've got a month to go through and uh, dissect Solomon's reign a little bit more. But that just kind of gives us a precursor of what we can look forward to. Any thoughts? Any comments? That's pretty strong words right there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, it is. And, you know, we're going to see just how great that, you know, we're going to see Israel uh, experience prosperity uh, of the likes that, you know, those people have never imagined. And, you know, you think about, of course, when they when they came out of Egypt, they came out with great prosperity. But, you know, they were nomads. They didn't have a home at that point in time. So it didn't do them a lot of good uh, in, in, in one sense. Uh, I guess it did toward building, erecting the, uh, the tabernacle and whatnot, but uh, of their own, uh, it didn't really help them. But now we're going to see where Israel is going to become so prosperous that what's the phrase? Silver was as if stones in the street. It was just, you know, everywhere. Wealth was just everywhere in abundance. But it's gonna, all going to come at a cost, as we'll see. But let's go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Kings 2, if you're not already there. 1 Kings 2. And so now we're going to see David's last words, his last instruction to Solomon here. And, you know, it's been said, uh, a father that that is what he should be, you know, his last words to his to his son, to his children, are going to be, you know, important words. Uh, those words, that, those things that, that are uh, essential. Uh, not trivial things, but essential things to not just life, but also to, to eternal life. But uh, here David is going to instruct his son Solomon in, in that path. It says in verse 1, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, the son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. That the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their, their way, to walk before me in faithfulness, with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So David is trying to encourage Solomon to remain faithful to the Lord, to walk in all his ways. And so what would be the blessing to Solomon doing that? What's the benefit to Solomon if he does that? Prosper. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's it's funny if if we took a practical approach to God's word, and we just took a sheet of paper, and on one side we wrote down, okay, you know, faithfulness to God leads to these things. You know, whether you know Solomon was a little bit different position than us, but regardless, you know, we could we could look at ours. Uh, our list, our benefits, you know, a better life, peace, comfort, hope, you know, all those things we could just list underneath there. Those are pretty good things. All right, not following the Lord, what would that bring? <laughs> you know, turmoil, <laughs> destruction, heartache, you know, all these things. From a practical point of view, which are you going to choose just casually looking at that? Which would be the wiser, you know, way to, to choose that? Well, we would always say, follow the Lord. You know, we're going to be blessed. Everything's going to turn out all right. But is that the way it works in life? It doesn't always work that way, does it? You know, if it was a matter of just making one decision, a snap decision right here, here and then it's over with, yeah, we would all choose life. We would all choose to serve the Lord and be faithful to Him. 
and you know, Lord, take me. You know, I agreed to those times. Take me on. Doesn't work that way. You know, temptation is a uh, it's an evil tool that Satan uses against us, that distracts us and turns us away from from faithfulness to the Lord. And uh, Satan is the master in using that to uh, manipulate us. Any thoughts through verse four? Christ says that if you'll take up your cross and follow me, that I'll be with you. And that people's going to be against you because you're following me. And, but still, he said, don't fear mankind that can take your body. Because if you go against God, he can take both body and soul. Yep. That's why you're to fear God and worship Him with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, I love what David says. Be strong and show yourself a man. You know, you ask the world, what does it mean to be a man? And you can get a lot of different definitions. Um, I've had people tell me right out uh, in, in the past that you know, they leave church to their wives. You know, they didn't view church as the assembly as, as manly, manliness. What does David say about that? What do you think God thinks a, a real man is? <laughs> Absolutely. Faithfulness. That's, that's what it means to be a real man. That's what it means to be a real, to be real. Faithfulness. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. All right. Beginning in verse 5. Um, hey, uh, what was the king supposed to do when he took the throne? Do you remember? Did anybody remember? Chapter read, was it read the law in its entirety? Chapter 17 and verse 18. When the king takes <laughs> the royal throne, he is to write a copy of the law by himself with the priest looking as a witness. And then the king is supposed to read all the days of his life. So picture that. I don't know if Saul did that. But David probably did because you read all the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119, Psalm 119, meditating your law day and night. Mm -hmm. And so with these instructions to Solomon, he set Solomon up for spiritual life. And I think that's what we're supposed to do as parents. Absolutely. He's really not setting him up to be king in a physical nature, but really for a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to do as parents, even at an early age, as we start. But it's important to get kids to Bible class and teach them. Yep. Of course, as we progress down the road, looking looking down the road, how important will it be when we get to the divided kingdom, you know, as far as having a faithful king? How much influence does a king's faithfulness have on a nation or a king's unfaithfulness have on a nation? Pretty big impact, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, the way of the king, so goes the, the way of the, of the nation as well. All right, so verses, uh, beginning in verse 5, there are some... You might say some loose ends David is leaving behind for Solomon to have to deal with. And I know uh, David regrets this, that he didn't handle these as he, he should have, but these are things that are pressing on David's mind, and he knows that um, you know if, if Solomon's going to have a, a peaceful reign and a prosperous reign, you know, these issues are gonna have to be these are gonna have to be dealt with at some point in time. So he begins in verse 5 and says, Moreover, you also know what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, and putting the blood of war on the belt, on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom. I love this verse 6. He says, you know, act according uh, 
Act therefore according to your wisdom. So use your wisdom in, 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 in dealing with uh, with Joab. But what's the next thing he says? <laughs> you know, use your wisdom, but at the same time, you know, don't yeah, don't let him don't let him die in peace. Handle handle this and uh, you know this doesn't uh, this doesn't sound like uh, David is is wanting uh, Joab to be able to continue as he is continuing. He's wanting to uh, Solomon to basically put an end to Joab. Uh, Joab has shed innocent blood, and you know, was it was were these questionable decisions David made in putting these you know Abner and Amasa in the positions that may be, but regardless, this was a you know decisions that God, uh, the Lord's anointed made, and did Joab respect those decisions? No, he never respected them. Well, I mean, you know, Joab, did he prove himself as a as a man that, that could be controlled? Be right. Exactly. Joab also knew that David had derived him. He had that over David's head. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. That would be leverage to uh, allow him to do things that no, nobody else would be able to do, to accomplish. That, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. So he uh, he tells them to uh, to handle Joab. The next uh, point on the agenda, he says in verse 7, but deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. And let them be among those who eat at your table. For with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom, uh, your brother. So you remember when uh, David crossed the Jordan going to Maenam. And uh, there were people there that aided him. And, you know, Barzillai was one of those. He, was, he seemed to be a, a wealthy nobleman there in Gilead. And he uh, provided them food and provided his entire company with, you know, sustenance, resources that uh, was desperately needed. And so David uh, really cherished that. And you remember on the way back to Jerusalem, he made that offer to Barzillai that he could become a part of his court and David would take care of him. What would Barzillai say? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be wasting out an old man, you know. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure at the time, but this says his sons. You know, it, it made mention of Chimham there in, in the uh, narrative. And uh, I wasn't sure who Chimham was, but this is a son. So Chimham apparently was was a son as well as uh, another must have went with David. At least another. At least two went with, uh, went with David and stayed with David. So uh, David encourages Solomon to continue to take care of those, those sons of Barzillai for, for their father's loyalty. Anything anyone wants to add to that? All right, the next on the docket is Shimei, verse 8. And there is also with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, from Bahiram, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day when I went to Maenam. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him, and you shall bring his gray head down with blood to shield. So it's interesting, you know, the the, the state opening statement is, you know, you're you're wise, and you you'll know how to handle this, but just don't let him die in peace. <laughs> don't let him die in peace. Whether it's Joab or Shimei, he kind of has the same the same response in that. Any any thoughts concerning Shimei? Well, we're going to see, uh, you know, and this is before Solomon asked God of, for wisdom. 
but we're going to see, I think we're going to see Solomon use some, execute some wisdom in the handling of these individuals as this plays out, which is uh, pretty encouraging. Verse 10 says, Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. You know, it's, it's, it's sad any time we, we spend so much time with a character you know, you grow close to them. Uh, you know, I know this. You know, this happened thousands of years ago, but when you when you cross that point where they pass, it's kind of a sad moment uh, to experience it. You know, we spend a lot of time with with the patriarchs. We spend a lot of time with Moses. Um, here, we spend a lot of time with David. We're going to spend some time in the future with uh, with other Bible characters, but. You know, it's always uh, it's always sad and, and uh, difficult to to see those go. Uh, maybe funny to say, but you know, you kind of build a relationship with them through the pages of God's Word, reading about them, and uh, you know, and David certainly uh, had his triumphs, but he had his low points, and uh, who can't relate to that? Who can't connect to that? It says verse 11, and the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. Uh, he was 30 when he began his reign in Hebron. It says here he, he reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. And so that's where we get the 70 years at the end that uh, when he passes. Verse 12, so Solomon sat on the throne of David his father and his kingdom was firmly established. Any thoughts, any comments? I will say, I think it's interesting. I think it's, I've got four, I think, listed here. There's probably more, but these are just the ones I have referenced. But how many times David is viewed as the standard for the kings that will come in the line of Judah after. So we've mentioned his successes and his failures. So what was it about, if, you know, if he had such major blunders in life, what is it that makes, makes him the standard? Well, it's his, his continual turning back to the Lord, even after those tragic mistakes. And so... I think uh, that's interesting. And then there, are, there's a, at least one time, Second Kings 20, where uh, God would have destroyed the southern kingdom immediately, but for the sake of his servant David. You know, he waits and does right. that, and then even preserves some of the seed that goes off into uh, the captivity and all that. So how influential David will continue to be as the standard and in some ways as the protection because of the promises that God made him. And I think that's interesting when you think about the promises that God made him, right? You'll have a king on the throne forever. So that's it, for all of the, the kings from Solomon on. You know they didn't they didn't live a life that caused them to deserve that, right? That's that's they're just born into the line, right? They were living off his legacy. Off his legacy. And so, in, in one way, you might say that their place in that was they didn't meet any conditions for it, and that's right. But every one of them got to make the choice whether or not they were going to be a positive in that line. You know, mm -hmm. so right. Uh, it will be that, that they receive some of the benefits of being in that order. That doesn't mean they get all the blessings that come from being the son of David or the grandson or great-grandson or whatever it might be. Because they get to choose whether or not they're going to be one who is held up by God or disciplined by him or whatever it's going to be. And, and of course, that idea of him being buried in the city of David points us to what Peter says in Acts 2. And, uh, you know, and it's a weird thing to think, well, that's going to be significant later. But, you know, a thousand years later, people will say, you know, we still know where he was buried. Mm -hmm. And that will be the key point to say, you know, David talked a lot about not being abandoned to death. And I, I think David, I think David was talking about himself in some ways. I think he was saying there had been times where he'd been rescued by God. God wasn't going to abandon him to Hades or the shield. And I think maybe there's even a way in which he's looking forward into the future and saying, None of God's people will be abandoned, ultimately. But Peter says, but he's in the very rotten right now, or has rotten. Mm -hmm. you know, what, mm -hmm. how, do, what, how do we make sense of what he's saying if that's true? He says, well, he's pointing to somebody else. And it allows, mm -hmm. and so basically it takes 1 Kings 2, verse 10, and says, remember that, compared with what David said about not being abandoned to Sheol or Hades and always having a king on the throne. Mm -hmm. And how does that even make sense? Well, we wouldn't know until it's all brought together in, in Jesus. Right. Yep, it was all shrouded in a mystery that, uh, you know, all these characters contributed to. Of course, nobody fully put the 
pieces of the puzzle together until we get to Christ, and afterwards the revelation was was given. And ah, an enlightening moment. All right, anything else? All right, beginning in verse thirteen. This is a this is an interesting exchange. Um, certainly welcome your thoughts uh, about this, but let's go ahead and charge right in. Then Adonijah. Who's Adonijah? Yeah, the fourth son of, uh, of David that felt like he was the rightful heir to the throne, yet uh, God had a different, a different son of David uh, in mind. At, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peacefully. So she had every right to <laughs> ask that kind of question with him. Uh, she said, Speak. He said, You know what? You know that the kingdom was mine. Does this sound like sour grapes? Does this sound like someone who has uh, accepted the Lord's will and uh, Solomon being chosen to the throne? No. He says, however, the kingdom has... Uh, okay, well, he says, you know that the kingdom was, uh, was mine and all of Israel fully expected me to reign. Maybe, maybe not. Of course, you know, he had paraded himself and tried to, uh, uh, you know, politic his way into that position. But nevertheless, however, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. So he acknowledges that Solomon was the Lord's choice, but does he accept, seem to accept that? Well, let's see how this plays out. Verse 16, and now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me, she said to him, speak. And he said, please ask King Solomon, for he will not refuse you to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, as my wife. What's your thoughts on that request? Who was Abishag and who is she now currently? And became what to him? Became a wife. Now she's Solomon's wife. And so think about, you know, what this is really saying here. What, you know, you think about the the roles of the wives, the possession of the wives with the transfer of the kingship, you know, that automatically goes to the, the heir, the one who is, uh, and yet Adonijah, what is he, you know, what is he really asking for here? You know, uh, with this request, we know that he has not accepted defeat very well here. And so, but Bathsheba says in verse 18, Very well, I will speak for you to the king. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king arose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. Solomon may want to back up on that statement right there after this, uh, this transpires. Verse 21, she said, Let Abishag the Shumite be given to Adonijah your brother as his wife. We're going to pause right there. And I'm going to let your mind, you know, kind of draw a picture on uh, Solomon's face, his expression at this point in time when this request is being made to him. What, what, you know, what comes up to mind when his mother makes this request to him? You know, I, I imagine a pause and then a look of like, are you serious <laughs> with this request? Verse 22 King Solomon answered his mother, And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother. And on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zariah. So Solomon, does he see right through this? I think he does too. I think he sees what, what the real uh, draw 
in this uh, in this question, this request is. Uh, you know, Adonijah is not satisfied. He's not going to be satisfied until he has the throne. He uh, he feels, you know, he was he was the fourth. He was the one in line, and this you know this belongs to him. And he feels cheated, obviously. And so. The question probably as soon as she asked it. Yeah. Let's continue on and then we'll, we'll backtrack some. Uh, then King Solomon, verse 23, swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me and more also if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now, therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of David, my father, and who has made me a house. As he has promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So how well does Solomon react to this request? Excellent point. Solomon give Adonijah an opportunity here. What's Adonijah doing with the opportunity? <laughs> he's, yeah, he's proven himself unworthy. He's proven himself unworthy to live. So it says, uh, verse 25, So King Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. So, my question to you is, Bathsheba's role, what's your thoughts on her role in presenting this to Solomon? What did she owe Adonijah to even have a conversation with him? Absolutely. That's my thoughts. That was my thoughts. You know, uh, some people think, well, she's just trying to keep peace. I don't think so. I think she knew what her son's reaction would probably be with this petition. And she knew that uh, this was what would uh, finally get rid of him. That threat would be over with after she presented this to her son. What's your thoughts? You Y'all y'all feel the same on that or Yeah, because she could have reacted and said, No, I'm not gonna give you any time. Because there was mm -hmm. no way he was getting into Solomon's presence. Right. So the only way he's gonna get that she could have said, No, just Solomon said go to your house. Mm -hmm. the just go back there, you know. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to maintain peace, that would have been the way to do that. Express her frustration. I don't want anything to do with you, go home. Right. Right. But no, she takes the question before him. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, absolutely uh, when he drove uh, David out, went to his concubines, right. and, and, and was making a statement about that. Right. And I, I don't know that Abijah's not thinking the same. I, I don't know. I don't know that Abijah realized how much he was laying his cards on the table. You know what I mean? Right. He was like, yeah. Maybe he thought he was being like sneaky here, but I think he's just uh, maybe just so desiring the kingship that he's willing to do whatever and doesn't think about the clear, yeah. the, the, the clearness of his, you know, kind of. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. Uh, sometimes we can be so engulfed with a passion that we're just not able to, you know, see things outside of our vision, our tunnel vision that we have. And I think that I think that's a good point. I think he, uh, yeah, he, uh, uh, he played his entire deck here and uh, messed up. He didn't have anything to. The only question about that is Marcy, you may be able to, in, in history, to be able to, to answer this. As, as a woman during this period of time in history, would she have had the right to refuse to call him? Or would she have had to have played a role like she, it would have been kind of, not her beauty, I wouldn't say that, but kind of her role to do that and then let them figure it out with one another. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's a good question. There are, I don't, I don't know all the places. I don't know if I can reference one right now off the top of my head, but I think there are a number of places where the mother of the king, especially Judah, is noted as like an advisor in some ways, which is interesting along the way. Well, I mean, you know, and that, that might be the lean here where she's seated on his right hand. Yeah. I mean, that is a position of, uh, you know, renown. In other places, it's a position of authority. Yeah, right yeah, so it's yeah. At least yeah, that is a good question about what what her responsibility was. I think Solomon would say, "Who cares what your responsibility is here? Like, let's just get this thing care of." But, but uh, that's all. 
Anything else? All right, so Adonijah is gone. Next, verse 26 says, And to Abiathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your estate, for you deserve death. But I will not at this time put you to death, because you carried the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because you shared in all my father's affliction. So Solomon expelled Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord that he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. And, you know, I read through uh, some of Bob's notes on that, and uh, I think I understand. I don't know if I can express it clearly, uh, explaining, but uh, uh, let's see. Aaron had two sons, and the priesthood came, of course, through Aaron, but then it went through Eleazar, his son. Well, he had another son by the name of Ithamar. And as it goes, uh, I think Eli was of the house of Ithamar. So is Abiathar right now. But Zadok is of Eleazar. And so uh, Ithamar was the priest under, let's see, no, uh, let me get this straight. Okay, uh, Abiathar was, his father was slain by Saul or by Doeg, wasn't it? Not earlier, when David, you remember, goes to the uh, tabernacle for showbread, eats the showbread. I, absolutely, that's right. Okay. Well, that was Abiathar's father, I think it was, that was executed for aiding David on that. And so Abiathar, you know, fled for his life and sided with David. And, but uh, Saul anointed Zadok. As, as priest at that point in time. And so, uh, you know, David's uh, appreciation and his loyalty to uh, Biathar, when he becomes king, he just makes the union, has both of them as high priest during his reign. But now we see that, you know, Biathar makes it convenient to get back down to uh, one priest and really the right lineage of, of priest through uh, from Aaron to Eleazar and so on and so forth. And so Zadok would fall in line with the proper priesthood priesthood there. Abiathar uh, was really not of the proper priesthood the way I understand it. So this uh, this is a, a fulfilling of uh, the prophecy that was spoken concerning Eli who was in the line of Abiathar. Was that muddy enough? <laughs> uh, it got pretty muddy for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. I looked over it, but, you know, the name sometimes, uh, uh, as I said, that muddiness, that murkiness, uh, I, I lose track of the name sometimes. Well, I have a side note that I wrote that said, God, God fulfilled the 180-year promise concerning the house. And, you know, uh, for most everybody else, did you think probably anybody remembered that prophecy at this point in time? God did, and it's and it's pointed out here, and you know it, it just continues to uh, express his God's loyalty. When he says something, he always follows through. He never uh, he never forgets. You know, quite indifferent to uh, to us. Uh, anyway, anything else before we move on? To verse twenty eight. We are just about out of time, and I don't think I hate to run through Joab's uh, story too fast. I think we may hold off there. Pick up verse 28 uh, Sunday night. Any thoughts, any comments as we close? Yes, he is. He is. But it's needed. You know, he, he will be able to uh, start his reign and everything will be a lot smoother by, you know, following his father's advice and dealing with these things, the, these loose ends, as I said before, before he, uh, he moves forward with his reign. So, well, all right. I really appreciate y'all's comments and contribution. Thanks for watching. 
If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.